call it spring. So uh, our, our spring fever hasn't quite worn off yet. We're, we're still wanting things to, to bloom. They're now finally really starting to look good and starting to bloom because it was so cold this spring that everything just kind of held off until it warmed up. So now we're here to just really get our, our flower fix for the season. So as you can see, I've got quite an assortment around me today. I hope you brought lots, lots of questions. Uh, we're, we're basically going to go over uh, you know, what is good for blooming and when, and how to make things bloom. I really want to talk about how do you make sure the flowers are looking their best. Uh, if you were to pick your favorite flower, and, and, uh, or maybe something in your yard that is flowering, Google it. I mean, actually, get, get online and look up images of that particular flower and ask yourself, does mine look like that? Because I, I guarantee you, you're going to get some fabulous photos coming up. I want you to ask yourself, does mine look like that? If not, we're going to go over the stuff that you can do today to make it look like that. So, uh, let's, let's begin with uh, 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 the two main things that really help things to bloom. So let's say I have, um, this is a really good one right here. I remember the first time I bought one of these. Look just like this. This is a, a cottage carnation. Uh, you can see it's probably about six inches wide, maybe seven. It's got a few flowers on it. Looks great, right? I took this home, planted it, and fed it with bone meal that, that fall like I do everything. And the next spring, I looked at it and there were so many flowers on there, I got curious and I started counting. And somewhere after 50, I just gave up. That's what happened. That's, that's because of something uh, that bone meal has called phosphorus. Whenever you look at a, a, a fertilizer, so like, like the 744 here, this is an all-purpose fertilizer. There's always three numbers on here. So that first one is nitrogen. This is for leafy growth. This is to, to get lots of foliage, uh, longer, uh, bigger, more uh, leaves, depending on the shape of the leaf. The, the second one is phosphorus. That's for blooming and rooting. So it's important for the health of the, of the plant because it's got to have strong roots, but it's also important for making blossoms. Without it, the plant will sit there and look green. So if you've ever, uh, you know, you might remember back to when you first started gardening, everybody seems to, to do this. Uh, they, they try putting bone meal, uh, not bone meal, uh, blood meal or fish fertilizer on the, the vegetable garden and wondered why uh, uh, their onions just look like chives and there's never a bulb. That's why. It's because that, that phosphorus is important for making bulbs and roots. And the same thing happens when you have uh, uh, flowers. So you might remember the zucchinis and the tomatoes, they never blossomed. They just got really green and pretty and they never blossomed, never made any fruit. It seems like everybody goes through that phase the first time. So that's why that, that middle number is really important. You want to continuously feed with that. Last number is potassium. It has to do with immunity, strength of the stems, things like that. So when you're buying an, uh, uh, a general fertilizer, you can see there's, there's, there's phosphorus in there. And that is enough to keep things blooming and looking good. You can, however, bump that up with a supplement. You can, you can add something that it has just the phosphorus so that you can really get that number up higher. And there's different ways to do that. Bone meal is, is kind of the classic way to go. Bone meal is something that it takes a long time to kick in. It takes months to really start working on the plant. But it will have great effects. Like I said, you put that down in fall, by spring it's finally kicking in, right when you want it to, and things just start blooming like mad. Like I said, this one, when I had planted it, it looked just like this. And next spring, it was probably about triple the size I had used this uh, for general growth and health, and then added the bone meal for the fall. And it was triple the size, and I, I estimate there was probably about 80 or 90 uh, flowers on it. It was just incredible. So that was uh, kind of my early, early gardening experience that has always really stuck with me. That's the importance of phosphorus. 
Like I said, bone meal is a very slow acting ingredient. It's got lots of phosphorus and it's very effective, long lasting too, it'll, it'll generally work for most of the year. But it's already June. It's a bit late to put down something that slow acting, right? By the time it kicks in, we're gonna be going into fall and winter. So really, you wanna go with something faster acting. There's different ingredients. You'll find we also sell superphosphate down at the store, a little faster. But for something that this late in the game, the one I'd really go with is the flower powder. This right here is the water soluble. So this is instant. This is not something that has to break down in the soil and work its way through the root system. This is something, you mix it with water, you pour it in, immediately the roots absorb it and it goes to work immediately in the plant. It's instant. So this is highly effective. If you look at the numbers, 10, 52, 17, so that middle number, crazy high. That phosphorus count is as high as you can get it. We basically, Ken just said, how high can we get that phosphorus count before it just turns to gel? <laughs> when you try to mix it with water, that's what he, what he basically said. And so 52 was about as high as we could get it. So this is something you pour it in and you'll start to see what you actually see in those pictures when you Google your favorite flower or whatever's in your yard. Now the second thing that you really want to do is deadhead. So basically, if you look at it from a flower, flower's uh, point of view, the, the, the plant is the plant is always thinking about seeds. It's not thinking about looking pretty. You bought it for pretty. He, the plant is thinking about I want to make seed. I want to make a flower, and I want the flower to have some color in it to attract bees and pollinators and then I want that flower to turn into seed. And so it's always budgeting. It's always thinking, okay, how much phosphorus do I have available? So again, this is where that fertilizer comes in. And it says, how much of that phosphorus do I have available? How many flowers can I make with that? And then it, it, it makes uh, those blooms, and then when those blooms start to turn to seed, the plant is thinking, oh, this is great. I'm, I'm succeeding, I'm, I'm making my seeds. And it starts to get kind of lazy at that point because it's, it's doing what it, it, it always meant to do. So what you want to do, let me grab, you know what, I just grabbed a, a few. Hold on. Make sure to grab a few that uh, could use some deadheading here. So you can see how some of the flowers are starting to get a bit spent. You see that? So the petals are starting to, to wilt. It's been blooming for a while, and the petals are going to fall off, and then the seed pod will, will begin to form in the hip. Again, to the plant, this is good news. To us, we know that this is going to make the plant feel a little bit lazy. And we don't want it to do that. We want it to keep blooming. So what I want to do is I want to take that flower right off. OK, now the plant's thinking, oh, I lost one of my flowers. An animal came along and ate it. <laughs> and now it's not going to turn into seed, so I need to try again. And now it's going to keep thinking about making more. It's going to keep blooming, trying to get to that end goal of making seeds. So as long as I keep deadheading, it's just going to keep doing that. Here's another one. I want to take that off. I'm going to go ahead, go down to where there's a, you know, a good amount of leaves. Don't leave stems sticking up. Where's my scissors? I thought I had brought my, oh, I left them in there, that's okay. No, they're here. So generally, uh, you can, sometimes you can pinch them off with your fingernail, um, if you can do that without really crushing the stem. Uh, just depends on the flower. But if not, get a sharp pair of scissors or snippers or pruners or something, and just kind of go in there once in a while, pull out you know, old dead leaves, anything that's not looking its greatest, and deadhead. I can see there's a bud right here. I don't want to take that off. Make sure I leave that. But I'll take off that, that flower that's not looking so great. That not only keeps the plant looking good, but it keeps it flowering. Like I said, as soon as, uh, as, soon as the, the flower goes to seed, the plant starts getting lazy. So don't let it get lazy. This is a geranium. It has clusters of flowers. So I'm just going to get in there because there's buds in there. I don't want to take all the buds off. So I'm just going to get in there and kind of 
I'm going to pull out the, the spit flowers until it looks good again. And then, uh, you know, sometimes this can be a little time consuming. Like I said, if you've been feeding with phosphorus, you are going to have a ton of flowers to dead heads. So sometimes you even want to just look for a, a plant that uh, has a tendency to bloom like crazy, whether it's been dead headed or not, if you're really a busy person. You can see it's already starting to look better. You now, you remember those those petals looked kind of almost burned. You know, they were kind of blackened from wilting. So it looks better. That's also encouraging it to keep blooming. And now the plant is thinking, okay, that, that failed to turn into seed. I need to try again. Okay, how much phosphorus do I have? How many flowers can I replace that with? Quite a few, actually, because I've been getting regular fertilizer from my caregiver, from my gardener who takes very, very good care of me. So you want to think about health, keeping the plant healthy, strong, so that it can really put a lot of energy into making flowers. You want to give it phosphorus so that it has what it needs to make the flowers. It does take a lot to make a lot of flowers. And you want to keep deadheading as much as your time will allow. So if you can remember those three things, you're really going to have a fabulous yard. So again, my regimen is using that all-purpose fertilizer and then using some kind of phosphorus supplement with it. And everything, and people literally walk by my garden, not to brag, I'm just po making a point. They walk by, stop, look, and say, that's amazing. They love it. It's all color. Just color, 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 they love it. So it's, I, I, I'm kind of a cottage gardener, so I tend to have a lot of flowers kind of all packed together, and so it's just blaring almost. You, know, you can see it from a distance. You, you know that's mine. <laughs> and, and people who, who come to my house, they go, look for the one where it's just all flowers. Family members show up and they're like, is Tarzan gonna like jump out at me from this jungle? That's just me. <laughs> but uh, that's, those three, Three steps are, are the reason why it, it looks that, like that. And even if, you know, sometimes I get a little busy and I don't really give the best care possible for a little while, because it gets such good care most of the time, it, it still looks good. Any questions? So how often is this fertilizer? Have you seen this yet? I mean, the actual content. Some of you I can see our regulars here. You know this fertilizer, you know what it looks like, you know what it smells like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a natural fertilizer. It's got things like cottonseed meal and bird guano and just natural ingredients all mixed together. So when you open it up, you're not going to see these even looking granules or crystals or anything like that. You're going to see just natural ingredients mixed together. And basically what I like to do, this is really easy. That's a nice thing about natural fertilizers. They're easier to use and they're more efficient. You'll notice their numbers tend to be really small. It's because they're more efficient than synthetics. That's all there is to it. So I just open this up and I start grabbing it like chicken scratch and just tossing it. And I just go through the whole, I go through the, the flower beds, just kind of tossing it in between the flowers. And then I go around the trees and I just, toss it, walking all the way around the tree until I've gone all the way around, go around the bushes the same way, and just toss it. And I don't really measure it. It will give you directions on measurements. Once you've used it before, you just learn to eyeball it. It's just that easy. So very, very easy. And again, four times a year. So spring, summer, fall, winter. That easy. Yeah. We have the drip system, so... Yeah, most people have drip systems and that's okay. It's still going to work its way into the soil. Yeah. Okay. And again, because it's a natural ingredient, it just kind of works its way in, becomes part of the soil and enriches it naturally. So very easy. Even with weed cloth, um, it still kind of eventually works its way through the gravel, through the weed cloth, and gets down into the soil. If you want to go out there and, and get it to a, a faster start, by all means, you can grab the hose and shower it down. Very easy. Any other questions about? Um, do your flower, I don't know if this is going by, but, but your, you know, your big flower garden, does it ever take the weeds? It's like so many weeds. I mean, do, I mean if you put enough flowers in, the weeds go away? Um, in my case, yeah. 
uh, there's, there's so many, her question was, um, does it keep the, flower, the weeds down when I have this many flowers in my house? Yes, <laughs> it actually does. I get very few weeds in those flower beds that I have densely packed. So at my house, I, I kind of have uh, two areas. Um, up close to the front door is where I have uh, the plants are, are more densely packed. Um, things that need regular care are, are all situated there. And then in the rest of the yard, that's where I put the xeriscape. I'm a gardener. I love gardening. If you let me, I will spend 24-7 in the garden. But <laughs> nobody has that much time. And you know, let's face it, we, we live in the desert. We live in the high desert. We only have so much water, so let's be conservative. So, you know, most of the area, most of the property, it's just xeriscape. I put in plants like um, butterfly bush. And what else have I got up here? Lavender. Lavender needs very little care. I've got another butterfly bush here. Right here, this is a, a white butterfly bush. This one I'm holding here is a dwarf. This is a new release this year called um, Pugster. I almost said Pugsley. <laughs> this is Pugster. This is a dwarf butterfly bush with full-size flowers. I'm eyeing this thing for myself because <laughs> it would go perfect in my xeriscape. So that area that I just, I, I never really water, I just kind of leave it to rain. I don't even have a drip system out there or anything. Everything that needs to be watered on a weekly basis is all by up close to the house, up close to the entrance. That's where I put all the, the real colorful stuff. Flowers are packed densely together, and even that stuff in the beds, I hardly ever water. You know, I might do it a few times a year when it's really dry. I've got snapdragons and pin cushions. I've got, um, even, I've even got some speedwell in there. All they get is right here, the spiky thing. All they get is some runoff occasionally from the containers when I water those. That's not much. It's not enough to live on for anything else. Gara, this is something that I have out of the Xeriscape. I don't water it. It's on its own. I water it when I put, first put it in, and then it's on its own. It's living on rain. Coreopsis. Oh, sorry, this is Gara. This is Gara. This one's Coreopsis. Big family. Lots of different types of Coreopsis, so it kick seed. This is a wildflower. Uh, Echinacea. That one's a wildflower. And this one, ooh, having fun with the speaker there. I think I have more of these than anything else. That may be pincushion. I, I just have these all over the place because they do so well in xeriscaping. So if you, if you want to have an area that you want it to look really pretty and bloom a lot and don't want to water it, this is a great one. Uh, this is an uh, autumn sage and it comes in different colors. Yes, yes. So the one you have is called Hot Lips, the white red flower. It comes in different shades of pink and red and purple and yellow and white and comes in a lot of colors. Gets real bushy, two to three foot. Crazy easy. I and mean, it lives off of rain and looks fantastic. Looks like someone's caring for it and it's not. Um, What's it look like in the winter? It'll go dormant. Okay. And then you can cut it back at the end of winter. Same with the Gara. Uh, basically what'll happen with these, I love the, these two flowers because they bloom all summer. Not every flower does that. Lavender will bloom in the spring and then just kind of cut out, or maybe early summer. And then, cut, and then it's done. These just keep blooming until frost. Yes. Are they deer proof? Are they deer proof? Yes. These are animal proof. I, don't ball. I have javelina that literally come through my yard every single night. They just, it's just part of their path. They walk through and they walk by everything. I have tons of stuff planted. They walk by all of it because they know she doesn't plant anything that we want. They're just going from point A to point B and passing through. That's it. Now what what, can, can I interject something here? Yes. Uh, for those of you that get our newsletter that comes out on Saturday, that topic was covered by Ken with some fabulous photos of those of those plants uh -huh. just today. And if you don't get our newsletter, if you signed our sheet, you will start to get it. But it's also available on our website under the blog. It should be the very first blog 
there because it was the last thing posted. So if you want some nice photographs, if you're thinking about buying some of these plants and can't quite remember what Ella said, yeah. go there and, and it'll help you out a lot. I definitely have a lot of plants here. I do not expect you to memorize these or even be able to write fast enough. So by all means, go on our website, look for the list, look for the article coming out. Uh, you said today it, 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 Yeah, it came yeah. out at, at 6.45 this morning. Yeah, it, it hit, the, hit the website at 6.45 this morning. And we also have a, 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 br a brief list of things that are animal resistant. A lot of this stuff is on here. The butterfly bush that I had mentioned earlier, this gorgeous spirea here, again, which comes in different colors. This is chaste tree. Now, flowers do not have to be limited to things on the ground. This right here is chaste tree, uh, just gorgeous. I, this is one of my favorite blooming trees. It doesn't look like a tree yet. It's gonna look like a bush for a while if you plant it this way. It'll look like a bush for a while and it get, turns into a bigger and bigger bush. And then finally it starts to form these multiple trunks and turns into this gorgeous tree. I just love seeing this thing bloom around town every year. Another tree over here is this Ruby Falls. Now it's done blooming for the year because it's a late spring bloomer. This is a type of red bud. It's a weeping red bud. This is that one with that bright fuchsia color where all the branches just turn fuchsia in the late spring. And then it gets these gorgeous heart-shaped leaves. Love these. The pink one, is that spirea? This is spirea. And it's not half as delicate as it looks. I, honestly, every time I look at this thing, I think this thing looks like it, it belongs on the East Coast. And it honestly looks like it, it does. But I have seen spireas that are pretty old be completely neglected. The tenant is gone, and this thing is just going and going and going, like, doesn't care. These are wonderful, wonderful blooming plants that uh, right now, actually for the past several weeks now, if you're seeing a, a, a bush that looks like it's covered with snow, that's a type of spirea. Yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous spirea. Yes? I have two questions. The one that you think I'd be pulling the spirea, the purple tree thing, back there, is that a part of the butterfly bush family? It's, it's not. It's not part of the butterfly bush. I know the flowers look similar, don't they? Yeah. Um, but this one, it's a really tough tree. Yeah. And, and it's unusual. I just saw a bunch of them in St. George that were on my back. They're beautiful. Yeah. But do they spread too? Do they get roots underneath? Are they spreading? You mean like do they sucker a lot yeah. or anything? Not really. I've never known them to be a, a, an issue. Okay. Um, the great thing about the chase tree, it, it takes such a wide range of conditions. You'll actually find it growing down in Phoenix. It can take that much heat. It can take that much dryness. But then you can bring it up here to Prescott and it's going to be just fine when the temperatures hit zero. No problem. It can take dryness. It can take a, you, you said you saw it in a, in, it grows really fast. Yeah. Like that one's like a year old. That's about the size I got. It's a one year old. The other thing I wanted to ask you is that, um, is that that bottom, the sage thing, is that um, salvia? Is that the same yes. Salvia? Yes, uh, salvia is the botanical name of sage. So uh, sage, salvia, same family. So I've got them on a drip. I don't, they don't need to be on a drip. Um, honestly, mine aren't. Oh. Yeah, I, I would, I would definitely water them to get them started. But after, you know, a lot of things uh, that are up here, you water them for a year or two, and then you just take them off the drip and let nature have at them. Some of it, you know, you might have to keep an eye on, you know, once in a while when you're going through a really dry spell, you might have to go out and give them one or two waterings during that entire, you know, whatever number of months. Um, and then that's it. You know, just, just to keep them looking their best. And then that's it. You know, a lot of this stuff, surprisingly, is, is wildflower. So, you know, maybe two, three times a year if it's a really, really dry year. You know, we've had a few of those lately where we're just... Oh goodness, we go months and months without water, and it can get real hot during the summer. And I'll say, oh, okay, just just so that you look better, look look your finest. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out the hose and water you down. You know, and that might during a really dry year get done two three times in the whole year. So that's something that, you know, like I said, I don't I, I can't do the whole space. It's it's got to be xeriscape. So. And it's a great way to go to if you're renting, because I've done a lot of renting, and you don't want to put something in that's either going to be a trouble for the, the future tenants or for the landlord. So it's a great way to go. You can put something in and know it's going to be okay if 
if nobody ever takes care of it after you leave. You kind of want to know that it's going to be okay. You know, that's the way we are. Uh, let's see. What have we not gone over yet? Now, there are some things, like for example, this would not be a Myzerescape. <laughs> this is a hydrangea. I did have one of these at home. Uh, this one I have on the patio. It gets a lot of bright, indirect light throughout the day. Sometimes during certain points of the year, the light kind of comes down and, and is able to get in there. But uh, during the heat of the day, which is the most important, that's when it's, it's not direct light. But this one actually does just fine in a pot. And uh, so, like I said, I've got it on the patio in a pod. That way it's not out in the yard getting fried. And uh, again, you see a lot of flowers. This is something that you can't get away with not feeding. <laughs> so you definitely need to be really giving it a lot of phosphorus in order to make all these blooms. So your feeding is going to be really important. Uh, even my Xeriscape, I fertilize regularly. I may leave, as far as watering goes, I leave it to the rain, but I do fertilize on a regular basis to make sure everything keeps blooming and looking its best. Alright, give me just a sec. Alright. Now, I haven't really covered annuals. This, the, the, all the same rules apply to annuals. I want to take these home today. <laughs> these are gorgeous. Uh, I, I don't normally do annuals that much myself. I do them a little bit sometimes, particularly in winter when everything else is dormant. I'll, I'll put in pansies. These are just irresistible. I want to take these home. But it's same rules, same feeding, same deadheading, and uh, just really making sure that uh, uh, that they, they get that same kind of regimen. Of course, you don't have to worry about long-term health as much with these. So it's mostly going to come down to making sure that they can just bloom their best. And so it's more about, th this right here is a petunia. Yeah, uh, I've actually had people asking me, what's that? It's a petunia. <laughs> it, it, the color is just so striking that you can't quite tell what it is. So with the pet uh, petunias, uh, pansies, geraniums, uh, I've got pintas. Uh, we're actually, for those of you who aren't here, we're actually in the greenhouse where all the annuals and vegetables and herbs are kept. And so I'm just looking at a sea of color right now. And so basically, uh, it's all about the same rules. With annuals, uh, the great thing about annuals is that they bloom like mad. They weren't meant to live for a long time. So in their mind, they're thinking, I gotta make seed, I gotta make seed. I'm not gonna live long, I gotta make seed. So they just bloom and bloom like mad. Uh, so that's the great thing about them. But when it comes to the deadheading, when we have something like this, can be a little bit difficult to pinpoint each and every little flower to, to, to deadhead. That's okay, because a lot of times what will happen with things like these petunias is, is they, they grow out more and more and start to get kind of leggy. You can actually take them and just start trimming them back. So for example, this one right here. At some point, this is gonna to start to look kind of wound out. Don't try to dead head each individual, just take the scissors and start snipping. And just kind of almost hedge it. And cut a little bit shorter, and that will actually help uh, it to grow out new leaves and more foliage and fill out more. Otherwise it starts to flatten out. So go ahead and just trim away at it rather than trying to pick individually. And this is called the million bells. I think you can see why. I'm not gonna try to pick out a million little bells and, and dead head. So go ahead and just start snipping away. I know a lot of people are afraid of cutting plants. Please keep this in mind. In nature, plants actually depend on animals to eat them. They need to be pruned. They need to be trimmed. Don't think you're going to hurt it by cutting at it once in a while. They like it. Okay? Don't worry. So uh, go ahead and go for it. This one right here. I think the last class that I did was rose class, wasn't it? So the whole same thing, big flowers, lots of flowers, you want to be sure to keep up on that feeding. This right here is a rose tree. It's actually been grafted right up here. So this trunk 
Uh, when you buy a rose tree, you got to make sure that you buy the, the, the height that you want from the trunk because it's not going to get taller. That part doesn't grow. This part does. So keep up with your deadheading. If you have any rose questions, come to me or Cheryl. You guys know Cheryl. Cheryl does not teach classes. Uh, we, no matter how much we try to get her to, but she is our rose queen and she can answer any of your questions when it comes to roses. She has a career in roses. So she can really help you out. <laughs> roses were very, very popular this year and last year, and more than expected, actually. So uh, <laughs> uh, sales just shot through the roof, and we ran out last year. And this year, we tried to stock up, and we found we were having trouble getting enough roses because everybody else was buying them. So we really had a difficult time. Uh, that all fell on Cheryl to, to uh, try to find those roses that we needed for this year, but she did a pretty good job of getting some gorgeous, gorgeous roses in. We're gonna, we're about to take some, uh, uh, another feeding of flower power to all our rose trees, and they're gonna be just amazing. This is actually covered in flower buds right now. Yeah. That's the best way to get rid of the little white heights. The Roses and sunflowers do get bugs. So let's talk a little bit about bugs. So roses, for example, they get aphids. Um, aphids, uh, they'll get usually onto the buds and the new, new leaves as they're starting to come out. Some flowers are gonna have this issue. So what we wanna do, there's a couple of ways to go about it. In, in most cases, you're gonna be spraying with something. So like the multi-purpose insect control is very, very effective uh, in, in doing that. The thing about aphids is that they're always around. I can go and spray this. Right now, this is bug free. If you, if you guys come up close, you'll be able to see after the class. This is bug free. Cheryl has been keeping up on it. But uh, you do have, uh, aphids are always around. You, you can spray the whole thing, kill all the aphids, and more fly in. Aphids put rodents to shame when it comes to reproduction. They're literally born pregnant. Crazy. Crazy. Okay, one of the, it's, it's a common bug, but there's a reason. It's actually a very special bug. It has an amazing life cycle. It's one of those things you never even think about because it's such a common little bug. But it's actually, if you ever get a chance to look up, it's a year-round cycle. It's, it'll kind of blow you away. It's, it's really cool. But they are kind of a pain because of that. So it's something that don't expect to just spray it and then never see them again. It is something that you do want to kind of keep up on. So don't, don't panic when they come back. They will come back. Um, thrift, same thing. Except luckily with them, they pretty much just come out during spring and fall. Now, another kind of bug that you want to deal with, uh, be aware of when it comes to flowers, not this one, where I put it, is the bud one. There we go. They especially love petunias and geraniums. Don't ask me why, but they love these two flowers. Budworm is a little caterpillar. He'll start a little itty tiny green guy that you don't even notice. And he will actually burrow his way into the flower bud before it's open. And he'll kind of eat inside of there. And then when he exits, he'll be about the color of the flower. And then when the flower opens, it's full of holes, looks tattered. And you're wondering what's going on, well, that's a butler. Again, geraniums and petunias are the, are the favorites. And so because those are a little more tricky to get, you spray, and guess what? He's inside the bud. Your spray didn't touch him. So it, things start getting a little tricky. If you can manage to spray while he's still you know, outside of the bud, great. But even when he's still already inside, you're gonna miss him. At that point, you have to either be regular about spraying so that you can catch them either in entering or exiting, or you have to use a systemic. It's just one of those things you gotta be aware of. Um, we are carrying some, some natural uh, types of, of uh, insecticides for uh, killing caterpillars specifically. So if you wanna come in and talk to us, we can uh, talk, talk about those. Hornworms are another one. I'm seeing those all over the place. I don't know about you guys, but I keep seeing them crawling around. Um, they're notorious for attacking tomatoes. Actually, they get into everything. 
but when you're trying to grow tomatoes, that's when they're most noticeable because of all the damage they do. They can just devour whole parts of your plant. Any, any more questions about, uh, yes? Good job. Ah, crickets. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> so not crickets, that's pretty much the, the multi-purpose. The spray with the multi-purpose. Crickets are kind of a large, hard shell bug a little bit. So you want to make sure you use something that's effective and quick. Grasshoppers, I wanted, I brought this up not so much because it has directly to do with flowers, but because everyone's been asking me about it. I, I brought this up. Uh, remember the NOLO factory burned down <laughs> and everybody was coming in and saying, how do we get our NOLO now? Uh, it's back up and running. We literally got a last minute uh, surprise call from them saying, we got it. So here it is. I know a lot of you online were looking for this and wondering what you were going to do without it. It's here. It's in stock. It's on the shelves. So here's the NOLO. This is for grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are notorious for kind of attacking everything including flowers. They will just devour the flower, uh, the flower bud before it even opens. They especially seem to love mums. I don't know what it is about chrysanthemums, but they love those. And you just don't get anything out of your mums because the grasshoppers are eating everything. So now is the time to be trading for the grasshoppers. This is bait, and uh, it's a natural bait. It's a, it's a microbe that infects grasshoppers only. So very, very effective. If you've got grasshoppers eating your flowers, this is the one. All right, any questions? All right, let's see, what else have we, uh, what else do we need to cover? Yeah. One time I sprayed a, what, that was a multi Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Is there anything that you sell to get rid of other things? So the question is, um, can you use a, what do you do when you, you've got, uh, predatory bugs like praying mantis, but you need to spray. Most insecticides are not going to affect the one and not the other. There are ways to deal with this. If you want to go natural and, and rely more on your predatory bugs, there are things you can do. You do have to be patient because when you're relying on predatory bugs like ladybugs, praying mantis, things like that, uh, basically, what you're trying to do is is waiting for the ecosystem to, to get back into balance uh, when you're trying to get away from sprays. Actually, I can't remember the last time I used an insecticide at home because my ecosystem has come back into balance. Um, what will happen, like for example, on my roses, I'll get a breakout every year covered in aphids. Each little bud will just be a mass of aphid bodies. Can't see through them for all the aphids that are on it. Within a week, I'm aphid free. So it's one of those things that you, you have to, to be patient. Uh, you, you've got to let the, the let nature kind of take its course, and it's not going to happen overnight for you. But there are ways you can kind of help things along. So things like uh, using herbs. There's a lot of herbs that will uh, repel bad insects, but the, the good insects are actually not bothered so much by them. So planting herbs around the garden can help a lot. Uh, there are things like dill and mint uh, just don't bother. And if they do repel the good, the good insects, that's okay because they're repelling the bad ones too anyway, so it's, it's okay. So neither of them would be on that plant. So there are ways that they can do it. It's actually a fire, a flower pot fly. I thought it was a bee for a second. Uh, but you can see that you know just being uh, being natural is a great way to go, but you do have to be patient. You, you see a problem, you really want to spray, and you just have to hold back and say, I can't do that. i gotta, I got to let things take their course. And actually, you'll find that in the end, it's really effective. I mean really effective, but you do have to be patient. All right. Anyone else? Yes? On my stage in Rosemary, I get these clusters of spider web and stuff. Ah. Oh. What is spider webs with what? It looks like spider webs, but they're worms. Okay, it sounds like a bagworm. Does that normally come late summer? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, bagworms or tent caterpillars, they, they tend to come out a lot during, um, say, August, especially, is, is when they get really common. Uh, especially if it's like a big bag. Yes. Yeah. Like the, in, inside Gross. the dense part of the leaves, it'll just be saturated with web and black, like eggs. 
Yeah, that black, okay, so what you're seeing is, um, for those of you who are listening online, she's seeing these big uh, kind of cobweb looking things, and they're, they're just filled with caterpillars and little black stuff, and the whole thing just looks gross, and then the whole plant just seems to be getting eaten up. They usually appear around August. Uh, basically, it's called a bad worm, or you might find it under tent caterpillar. And basically what's happening is, uh, they, they, it's a caterpillar, and they, they come out in swarms. They just hatch out all at once. And then they build these, uh, these webs, and they, they, when they're sleeping, they sleep inside that, that web pocket to protect themselves from predators, like birds and large insects and things like that. And that black stuff you're seeing is actually excrement. It, that kind of builds up in there. Like I said, it's gross. And you'll see this, if, if you see it once, it'll keep coming back every year. Because they always go back to where they hatch to lay their own eggs. So it'll happen on the same tree, the same bushes, the same yard every year. And so you have to break that cycle. And so you'll have to get a, a good insecticide, like the multi-purpose, spray down the whole thing, kill them all. You gotta do it while they're active. Spray them all down. Make sure you saturate those uh, those webby pockets that they're they've been living in. Um, so you don't want them to be protected in there. But you, if you get in there and kind of jet jet spray into it and saturate the whole thing, um, there are they have favorites. They can get into all kinds of stuff, but they do have favorites. I, I find that they tend to really like um, Oregon grape, which is a native. It's a bushy thing that has a kind of holly look, looking leaf. Um, they love plum trees. Uh, what was the other one? And you said you were getting them in your sages and rosemaries? Yeah. They tend to get into the things that other, other insects don't bother. Kind of funny that way. So every now and then a, a, an insect shows up that can specialize in getting it the hard to get. Yes. So I think mine is at the top of the tree. I think it's a wild oak or something. Okay. I mean, we're talking 30 feet middle of it. Okay, so she's having the same problem in her wild oak, but it's like 30 foot up. In your case, there's only two ways to go. Uh, as far as spraying goes, get a hose and sprayer, take off the, uh, the fan nozzle, and that thing will actually jet usually approximately 25, 30 foot into the air. So you can actually get up there and actually get them. Um, the only other way would be to go as a systemic, which is the kind that you drench the roots and the tree itself becomes toxic to anything that tries to feed on it. Something that uh, uh, can be very effective, great on trees. I do recommend caution, read the label, make sure you're using it correctly and when. Uh, it's not something you want to go and put on flowers that uh, hummingbirds and bees are feeding on because, it, like I said, it makes the plant toxic. So it's one of those use responsibly. Is the spirea similar to yarrow? Is the spirea similar to yarrow? No. I can see how you, you would see that. Yeah, the flower is really similar, huh? Um, it's actually not. This will turn into a bush. Um, I don't have any yarrow up here right now, but there's some gorgeous yarrow down there in the perennials. And, uh, but it'll be, there'll be flowers. Uh, you'll find them growing in your yard sometimes because they are um, a native. But if you come into the garden center, you'll find more colors. And what about hostas? Do hostas grow here? Hostas will grow here in the shade, yes. And uh, I would say make sure that you have a fenced in yard. Because <laughs> they're also candy to animals. <laughs> How do clematis do here? How do clematis do here? Um, you know what they do? They, they, you can grow them here. They especially do well in forested areas. Oh, they just love it. If you're if you're here on the um, west side of Prescott, they go nuts. Um, in, in other areas, they'll may, maybe take a little longer to, to take off. You might have to put them in a shady spot because uh, you know the Prescott Lakes, Prescott Valley, it can be a little hotter, a little drier over there. Uh, so they do notice the difference. So you just gotta you know, put them on the east side of the house or something like that. They need light in order to flower. I, that's actually something I forgot to mention. Flowers do need light. It's just a fact. They gotta have light. You can't put them in a dark spot. Um, some of them can be put in a dim spot, but not necessarily a dark spot. So don't, you know, you've got that north facing alcove and you know, it's 10 feet in and it's just dark as ever back there. That's not the place to put a flower. Is 
Oh yeah, we, we've got a whole section of flowering vines over there. I can help you out after the class. Yes. So if you're looking for flowering vines, you want something that goes with a trellis, covers a fence, or even covers a wall, we've got stuff that flowers and looks fabulous. Uh, trumpet creeper, for example, will actually stick to a solid wall. Doesn't need a trellis, doesn't need a fence, it'll just stick to a solid surface. So uh, I've noticed they, they are building all the new houses with block walls right now. Not only does it make you feel like you have entered the yard, <laughs> but it makes the backyard really hot. You're basically standing in a stone oven. You're, you've got gravel on, under your feet, and then you've got block wall all the way around you. It's a stone oven. And you might find that your backyard is almost unlivable sometimes. Vines are a great way to go because they will cover that block wall really cool down the yard. I mean, just make a huge, huge difference. Vines are a great way to go. Trumpet creeper doesn't have to be trellised. If you do uh, have a fence or can put up trellises, a honeysuckle is another great one. Honeysuckle is really popular uh, in this area, not only because it comes in different colors, but because there's even an evergreen version. A lot of people like the fact that it doesn't look like sticks in the winter. So that's a great one to go with. And we've got others too that are just awesome. Vines grow fast. <laughs> Boy, do they grow fast, <laughs> yes. Uh, so vines and uh, trees are another one. Again, the way they're building houses now, I mean, we've all got stone ovens, so a shade tree is a great way to go. There's a lot of uh, fast-growing trees that flower. Um, I've got a couple of my favorites here. I didn't have enough room to bring them all up. Um, and of course, some of them are done flowering for their season anyway, but just some crab apples that we've got that are just gorgeous. My favorite is prairie fire, because not only does it have fabulous flowers in the, in the spring, but then it gets gorgeous fall color. So three seasons, wonderful. Yes? Do you ever have uh, sales on your trees? Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> The, I was just working my way up to that. We're actually having a tree sale. <laughs> uh, starting today? Starting yesterday? It's actually been going on for a little while. Okay. I think they had done like a pre-sale. Yeah, those, those that were at the class last week yeah. found out about it. Now we're promoting it to the general public. Yeah, so the, 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 the sale, the tree sale is officially on. So basically what it is, is if you buy three trees, um, the planting surface is half off. That right there is a big deal. So if you're if you've got a new yard, and I know a lot of you do, <coughs> you have hundreds moving in every day. Um, buy three trees, and you'll get the planting service half off. And it's any size tree. Any size tree. And when does the sale end? The seventh of July. Ends July seventh. Well, while we're sort of promoting things, mm -hmm. I'd also like to mention for those of you that are container gardeners. The courier is running a contest. Uh, if you take a photo of your container and you upload it on the courier website, there's a link to the website right on the front page of the courier. You don't have to go behind the paywall and subscribe and all that nonsense. We also have the same link um, on our site as well. So again, if you look where that blog area is, you'll see uh, a link to that. Uh, and then lastly, next, um, Sunday, I guess it is Sunday, the 30th. If you guys have dreamt about coming here and drinking wine and wandering through the garden center, here's your opportunity because we're, we're sponsoring uh, with the Rotary, Grapes for Grades. And it's all about the beauty of the garden center uh, and, and wine and the, uh, the uh, contributions, if you will, go to helping uh, the Rotary sponsor a class uh, for in the public schools over the summer for students that really need to continue through the summer in order to kind of maintain uh, their grades and so on and so forth. I think if I remember correctly, last year they raised over $50,000 in that one event. So tickets are on sale here at the Garden Center. Uh, I believe it starts at 5 o'clock and goes until 7.30 or 8. So it's just that perfect time to be here and just wander around. There'll be uh, Barry uh, at Elgato's doing appetizers and there'll be music and so on and so forth. That so. right there makes it worth coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
So I think what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and say bye to our friends online. And I'm still here to answer questions. We also have other associates that can help you out uh, with whatever you need. And